Amen, amen, amen. In our hearts in the, in the right position. Let's get our hearts and minds focused on Jesus Christ and his goodness. Um, it's always a good thing to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. So there's a couple things um, I want to, first of all, I'm just so excited, right? Have you ever been so excited that you can't really contain it? Have you ever tried to put a, a, a pillow in a box and to start busting out at the seams. That's how excited I am. Amen. Amen. So we are uh, going to be uh, continuing uh, the second week of God uses ordinary people to do extraordinary things. So as we as we begin to get into praise and worship, I want you to have some expectations. In Proverbs 23, 18, it says, Surely there is a future and, a, and your hope will not be cut off. So what, what is the one thing that you expect to get today? Let me tell you, we had a, a conference yesterday for the youth, and it was amazing. We had, amen, amen. We had the Tobers come up and talk about setting boundaries. How no is your protection word. How your voice matters. Yeah, we were talking to kids, but we're talking to you too. Your no is important. Your voice matters. And then we had the Mahafis come up and talk about balance. And we all know as adults and young people that balance is everything. It says in the scriptures that a false balance is an abomination. And we always see it. When you, when you lean one way or another too much, you begin to fall and tip over. And then we had Pat, Sister Dorcas come up and, and deliver a powerful testimony that connected all the pieces. And, and the title of, of the conference was Overcoming Obstacles. So I'm here to tell you today we are overcoming obstacles because we are overcomers. So again, before Sister Carol get up here, before the preaching, I mean, before the, the, the tribe of Judah starts, set your mind with expectation so you can get something today. Amen. Let's bow our head and pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for a wonderful opportunity to be in your midst again, to be around other people that believe the same way we believe, Father. We learned today that unless two are agreed, they can't walk, Father. So we agree that you are the King of kings, you are the Lord of lords, Father, that everything will bow down to you today, Father. Every situation, every obstacle will bow down to you today, Father. In Jesus' mighty name we pray, amen. Hallelujah. I ask you to stand to your feet. Let's worship the Lord. Hallelujah. I want you to clear your minds, open your hearts. Think about this statement. Anointed imagination. So what, right now I want us to have and imagination. Right now, everyone here has a different vision. God has given you a different vision. I want you to close your eyes and think of when you were a little kid and you used to play with objects and make them, make, make them come alive. Just imagine when you're a little kid, you had, we used to take grass and when it rained, we put it on the curb and race grass. Everybody looking like, 
but it was, hey, you didn't have a lot of money, you, hey, you made some stuff up. But that's the type of imagination that God wants you to have, that kitty imagination. Because it's a kitty imagination, when you were a kid, you trusted, you believed. Then adulthood hit, and all of a sudden we got intelligent. And it got in the way. Anointing imagination, the ability to create new ideas or pictures not presenting to the senses that God approves and empowers us to live out for his glory. Right now, I want you to have that imagination. And I want you to think about that love that you have for Jesus. Hallelujah. Just close your eyes. Think about when you were a kid and you trusted your parents when they drove you somewhere. You trusted your parents when they said be at home before that street light came on. Hallelujah. Lord, my heart is yours, it all belongs to you, I give you all the glory, yes, I love you, I worship and adore, I'm gonna tell you And I love you, Lord, how oh, I love you, I love you, Lord, how oh, I love you, I love you, Lord. Sing it again, Lord, my heart is yours. Lord, my heart is yours. It all belongs to you. I give you all the glory. Yes, I love you. I worship and adore. I'm going. Tell you more, oh Lord, how much I really do love you. Let's say that one more time. Lord, my heart is yours. Point to your heart. Lord, my heart is yours. It all belongs to you. I give
That's why I need to happen right now. All men, raise your hand. All young men, raise your hand. Evan, you're a young man. Raise your hand. You're going to say, you are worthy, Lord. All the men, you hear me? So you're going to say, you are worthy, Lord. You are worthy, Lord. All men, sing with me. You are worthy, Lord. You are worthy, Lord. Take it up a little. You are worthy, Lord. You are worthy, Lord. Back down. You are worthy, Lord. You are worthy, Lord. Come on, man, let me hear you by yourself. Take it down. He's worthy. Lord, I want to say that I love you. For all that you brought me through, Lord, we thank you. We just say thank you. We just say thank you. <laughs> Don't know where else I could have been. Just thank you, Jesus. I love you. I love you. I need you. And I want you. I need you, Lord. I I need you. Hallelujah. 
he's worthy. Sometimes you just need to stay in a place. Just want to say thank you. I just want to thank you forever and never and ever for all you've done for me. <laughs> Blessings and Thank you. 
All the ladies say, Blessed be the rock. Blessed be the rock. Blessed be the rock. Blessed be the rock of my salvation. Blessed be the rock. Blessed be the rock. Blessed be the rock of my salvation. Keep going. Men, we say, Jesus is the rock. Jesus is the rock. Keep going, ladies. Men, Jesus. Jesus is the rock. Jesus is the rock. Keep going, ladies. Blessed be. Blessed be the rock. Jesus is the rock. Jesus is the rock. One more time. Come on, men. Jesus is the rock. Jesus is the rock. Hosanna. Hosanna. Blessed be the rock. Blessed be the rock of my salvation. Hosanna. Blessed be the rock. Blessed be the rock of my salvation. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, man. We got to pick it up. I heard the ladies. I can't sing soprano. I get Pastor Dale up here to do that. I can't do soprano, Pastor Dale. Hallelujah. That's John Meese's job. Hallelujah. How many of you want to be used by the Lord? Touch my heart, Lord, speak through me. If you can use anything, Lord, you can use me. Sing that with me. If you can use anything, Lord, you can use me. If you can use anything, Take my hand, Lord, and my feet. Touch my heart, Lord, and speak through me. If you can use anything, Lord, you can use me. Morio, go ahead, worship Morio. Thank you. 
time if you can use no music if you can use anything Lord, you can use me if you can use anything Lord, you can use me take my hand Lord Touch my heart, no speak to me. If you can use anything, Lord, you can use me. Take my hands. Take my hand, Lord, and my feet. Thank you, Jesus. Touch my heart, no speak to me. If you can use anything, Lord, you can use me. One more time. Take my hands, Lord, please. Take my hand, Lord, and my feet. Touch my heart, Lord, speak for me. If you can use anything, Lord, you can use me. something powerful there's something important about God's word I believe James said it this way he said I receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save uh, your souls he said faith comes by hearing and hearing by what the word of God so the more you and I hear the word of God, we give more opportunity for faith to come. In the book of Psalms 119 and verse number 105, David said, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a what? Light unto my path. How many of you know knowing God's word lights up your pathway in life? God's word is powerful. Turn to the person next to you and say, God's word is powerful. I need it. In the book of Hebrews, chapter 4 and verse number 12, the writer said, the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword and is able to pierce to the dividing asunder of the soul and the spirit, the joints and the marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. How many of you know the word of God could go into your heart and do what none others can do? Amen. Matthew 4 and 4, the writer said, but it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. In the book of John, chapter 5, and verse 39, the writer says, Search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. Book of Timothy 2.15, Paul told Timothy, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And I'm going to leave you with one more thought in the book of Acts chapter 17 and verse 11. The writer said the saints in Berea were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word of God with all readiness of heart and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. So that having been said, I'm going to ask Carol to come 
and break the bread of life for us. Let's give her a big praise the Lord. first. See if y'all been listening to me. Because you know I'm a teacher so it's time for a pop quiz. But y'all should be able to pass this pop quiz. Okay? Alright. Now you don't have to tell me the exact, you might not remember the exact name of the teaching. But do y'all remember what teaching was this about? Can y'all see that? Somebody yell it out. Huh? Oh Lord, don't let them fail. Don't let them fail in the name of Jesus. What is this? Mustard seed. And what was that teaching about? Mountain moving faith. That you had the faith to move a mountain. All right. Y'all get a C plus. And I don't know. Okay, I know y'all gonna get an A on this. What was this teaching about? Casting our cares. And so the actual teaching was called God Cares. And we talked about everybody got a little handkerchief so that you could cast your cares, right? And so y'all cast your cares and you didn't take them back. Is that right? Okay, I'm giving y'all an A on that. Okay. So at least y'all get a B out of that, I guess, the whole thing. Wow. <laughs> Somebody said they'll take it. All right. So let's get back to. Uh, last week, you know, God just came in the Holy Spirit and carried on, didn't he? And that's how God does. He comes in and he shows out sometimes. But what I do want you to understand 
is that whether he shows out like he did last week or he doesn't show out at all, he's still here. And he's still showing out. Amen? So I want y'all to be receptive today because what we're coming back to finish talking about is that God uses ordinary people to do extraordinary things. Because really, God looks at us as extraordinary. Turn to your neighbor and say, you're extraordinary. Y'all extraordinary up there. And so last week we talked about our, I want you to know our primary scripture is Romans. No, I don't want that to be our primary scripture. I want our primary scripture to be 1 Corinthians 1, 27 and 29, which says, but God chose the foolish things of this world to put the wise to shame. He chose the weak things of this world to put the powerful to shame. What the world thinks is worthless, useless, and nothing at all is what God has used to destroy what the world considers important. God did all this to keep anyone from bragging to him. So God uses the weak things, the broken things, the things that the world would think, how could they do that? Why are they all that? Because he doesn't want anybody to be able to say, well, I did that. No, you didn't. God did through you. Amen? And so we're going to look at that. We're going to encourage ourselves in that today. And um, what we're going to do, last week we talked about people in the Bible that we well know who have done extraordinary things like Moses and Noah and Joseph. But I want to look at today, we want to look at some of those people that we would, we really don't know a lot about them. We really don't talk a lot about them in the Bible. Amen? So you can look on your handout, and hopefully I'll be pronouncing their names. I did try to practice how to say their names. So the first one is Shifra and Pua. And these were two midwives. They were commanded by the king of Egypt, or Pharaoh, to kill all the male Hebrew babies, but they refused to do so. And I put scripture about this so y'all can go back and look at all of that. But this is extraordinary. The, the Pharaoh, the king, the president, the ruler of the world at that time, right, said, kill all the male babies, and they refused to do so. That's extraordinary. That's some ordinary women doing some extraordinary things. Amen? Another person is uh, Bezalel. And Bezalel, now all these people are mentioned in the Bible because I wouldn't have been able to get them, so I didn't just make it up. But I'm just saying they're not people that we tend to study and talk about a lot. Are y'all with me? And so he was an architect. And I have one here who was an architect whom God gave the job of a lifetime um, to um, help to build the tabernacle and the building of the Ark of the Covenant, okay? And so, but what we do want to see, and we're going to talk about this a little bit later, is that he had the skill to do that. So remember, we talked about God will use people, you may not have a skill or a talent, but he's certainly going to use some people that have skill and talent. That's why we know he'll use anybody, right? Ehud, he was a judge who was sent by God to deliver Israel from 18 years of oppression by the Moabites. He was left-handed, and left-handedness, and even today I think some is just discriminated against, really because, you know, the majority of the world is right-handed, and so anytime something is off from what the majority is, people tend to discriminate against, right? Yeah. And so how many people in here today are proudly left-handed? Raise your hand. See? And most of us don't recognize, I say for myself, I usually don't notice a person is left-handed unless I see them writing something or like if we're eating and they are sitting beside me because now they kind of in my space. Because they <laughs> oh, you're left-handed. <laughs> or do y'all remember, I don't know now if y'all know today, but when I was going to school, it was a big deal just because they, you know how the little desk we used to sit in and you had to scunch yourself in them? And they had, they only usually had one left-handed desk either in the classroom or in the whole school, right? So I might have noticed, like, what? what's wrong with their desk? That's what we would say. What's wrong with their desk, right? <laughs> but guess what? God will use left-handed people too. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 What did she say? What did she say? 
Oh, okay. That's important. Be in your right mind and use your left hand. Okay. Hallelujah. Let's look at Shamgar. It says, uh, though Shamgar mentioned only once in the scripture, he still had time to kill 600 Philistines and save, five, and save Israel. Um, you find that in Judges. It says, after Ehud came Sham Shamgar, son of Anath, who struck down 600 Philistines with an ox goad, he too saved Israel. Ox goad is just really like a little prod that um, most of the time, it was like a long prod, had a point on the end, and oftentimes they used to, like when they had the oxen, they were pushing the cart, and that's what they used to prod them, so they called it an ox goad, okay? And so he was getting down, wasn't he? So, you know, some of these movies we see, you know, I was really into, like, uh, Lord of the Rings and, and Hercules and all that kind of stuff. You know, one man be killing up, you know, a thousand people, but really, back in the day, something was going on with that, right? If you choose to believe that, then I choose to believe it because I know when the power of God comes on folks, there's no telling what's going to be happening because it's not them doing it alone. So you tell folks out there, y'all better know who you're messing with. Turn to your neighbor and say, you better know who you're messing with. You better hope Jesus keep me. Asa. <laughs> Jesus, hold back. All right. Okay, Asa was the son of a god of godless parents who became a godly king, and he was one of the kings that um, you know it is noted that he was a godly king. He honored God. He pulled down the uh, Baal um, things, the things that they set up, and things of that nature. He read the scriptures and saw in there that. Uh, the nation was not doing what they needed to do. And even though his parents were not godly, he loved the Lord. And see, God can get through. You know, because we always say, you know, it's, it's according to your parents, like what's going to be going on. And I think parents, you know, you have a great, great influence. But if God want to touch your child in a special way, he's going to touch your child. He's going to make sure somebody gets to them, the word gets to them, some love gets to them, that they can walk out the walk that he wants them to walk out. Amen? Amen. Tychicus. Tychicus, he went with Paul on uh, part of his journey uh, from Macedonia to Jerusalem. He also uh, is alluded to have been with Paul in Rome, where the apostles sent him to Ephesus, and they say probably for the purpose of building up and encouraging the church there. And then uh, he also, I found this out, y'all remember uh, Nesimus, he was a, a slave who had run away, and Paul, uh, you know, he was converted, and Paul talked to his owner and asked him to let him come back, because, you know, if you run away, you could get killed then or something. And so they say uh, that Tychicus went back with him, not Paul, went back with him uh, to the owner. <clears throat> Uh, Asael it was a nephew of King David as well as the younger brother of both Joab and David's general uh, uh, Abishai. Abishai. And so they said his claim to fame, and it says it's actually in the scriptures as you look it up, he was swift of foot like a gazelle or a wild deer. And he's the one when um, Saul was in the cave going to the bathroom and some people, you know, he went over there David and somebody went with him. There was, you know, like somebody said, y'all going there and killing and stuff. But he was just going in there. Maybe he was going in there to use the bathroom too. And so anyway, but uh, his nephew was with him and uh, went with him in the camp of Saul and took the spear and the water bottle. Remember, and they just let Saul know we was here. They took the spear and the water bottle. Well, they say that uh, Asiel did that. Hushai, Hushai, um, it says, when I looked it up, it said a covert friend, but he was a friend of David, but they say a covert friend because remember when Absalom was in rule, um, they were trying to like send somebody in who would kind of have maybe a little bit of influence uh, with the counselors of, with Absalom so that they could know what was going on and get back and tell David. And so this is the one, his friend, uh, he was a counselor to David. His heart was to David, but he went and he stayed with Absalom so that he would know what was going on and be able to secretly inform uh, David about what's happening. 
And so these were just ordinary people. I just brought them up because these were ordinary people doing their ordinary thing, whatever their walk of life was, and they did some extraordinary things because most of these people that you see, what they did, if they had been discovered, they could have been killed or um, they might not have decided to do it because they were left-handed or they didn't think they met up to whatever it was, but still, they were obedient to the call of God and they did extraordinary things. Amen? So now I want to talk about a couple of everyday people. And so I'm sure you know some everyday people. Of course, we all know Rosa Parks. She got tired one day of having to go to the back of the bus and she said, I'm going to sit right down here when I got on the bus. And that became an extraordinary woman and changed many things in our lives. Amen? And what about the people who were during 9-11, those passengers on the plane um, that was going, I think was going to Pennsylvania or P Pennsylvania. Anyway, it's called United Air Airlines Flight 93. When they realized the plane was going down and what was going on, rather, when they realized what, that the terrorists were, you know, headed to uh, kill and destroy, they came together and they attacked them and, you know, they brought the plane down so that they could not do what they planned on doing. That's some ordinary people doing some extraordinary things, y'all. That's deep. How many of us would have been able to? You know, maybe we would have got caught up in it, okay. But we'd be, I know what we'd be doing. Jesus now, just get the people because we ain't trying to go down, right? <laughs> we'd have been praying. That's just like I remember when I was in the 12th grade. You know how like when you're in the 12th grade, you go on these little, I think I'm sure they still do it today. You go to a trip with your class and we were going to D.C., and we were on a bus, and so we had to go through some mountains and stuff. <clears throat> and it was uh, uh, raining or trying to snow or something. And the bus driver, I don't know what was going on with him, but the next thing we knew, we was kind of hanging off a little cliff, okay? And so we ended up having to all get off the bus so he could get the thing back. But I want to tell you, people was calling out Jesus. They never know Jesus. Oh, Jesus, help this bus get back on up here. And they was calling on mama too, because you know you call on mama. Mama and Jesus. <laughs> Thomas Edison, I thought this was interesting. It said that Thomas Edison was kicked out of school for asking too many questions. Isn't that something? And we all know Michael Jordan, right? Michael Jordan, it says, he didn't make the cut for his high school basketball team, but he became the sixth world champion six times, huh? Ordinary person became an extraordinary person. Just because people don't see your extraordinariness doesn't mean that you shouldn't go on and do what you gotta do, right? Then there's a lady, I thought this was really interesting. Now some of you all may know Misty Copeland, she's a black ballerina. She's considered one of the black, the, considered the first black ballerina. But I found a woman, her name is Joan, um, Janet rather, Collins, and she is really, she broke the barrier for um, <clears throat> the ballet color line. She was a prima, a prima donna, prima ballerina, and she was born in 1917. And I thought what was interesting about her, she reminds me of like, you know how we all watch Hidden Figures and the Three Ladies um, that we, we didn't know about, but they was awesome, wasn't they? Uh, and so she uh, had practiced ballet at a very young age. Her parents uh, took her to California because that was, at that time was where the ballet world was at when she was young. And she studied and she danced and she studied and she danced. And so she was beginning to be well known. And so uh, she did a audition for some kind of renowned uh, like choreographer or person who would hire you. And uh, now she's black, he was white, and he says she is like awesome, wonderful, magnificent, and I'll hire, but she has to put on white face. And so Janet Collins said, I'm not gonna put no white face on, I'm black. Just like, you know, they used to have in the old days, white folks putting on the black face. She said, I can't do that. And so she turned it down. And a lot of people, you know, not black people, thought, what's wrong with you? 
But she persevered and she ended up, because of her perseverance, a few years after that, she got a world-renowned position and she became a world-renowned prima ballerina, amen? Ordinary person doing extraordinary things. And you know, anybody, especially back in the day and even today, to stand up against the powers that be, to stand up against the political world, to stand up against racial uh, ties in our world, to stand up against financial things, anything that our world considers important. If you don't go along with the crowd, let me tell you, now we're not promoting any kind of dissidence or anything like that, just saying you're not going with the crowd. You're an extraordinary person. I know that uh, during the times when uh, a lot of things were going on, you know, Black Lives Matter is still there, but there was a lot of protesting and marching and things, and some of our young people wanted to be involved and were involved. That's extraordinary. You're an extraordinary person. Because even then, pandemic was at its height. Uh, it wasn't sure if you were safe. I know many of us were praying for some of the young people we knew that wanted to be involved, that they would not be hurt, amen? But yet, they went. And so, extraordinary people in extraordinary times. So, if my tape is working, are the, uh, is my video? Uh, no? Did I see a head no? No, okay. Well, then I'm just going to tell you about it, and you all can look it up. I had a couple of videos I wanted you to see. The first one is this guy, and some, some of you may have heard of some of these people. Some of them you may not have. There was a guy named J David Waddle. And he won the 800 meter um, run in the 1972 Munich Olympics. And so the video just shows him, they're, you know, how they're running the lanes, and he's at the back of the pack. And they, the rest of them, they're running, they're running. And so uh, you'll start to see him, you know, he starts to get up to the pack. Well, his claim to fame and why I chose him is that before, weeks before the Olympics, he had tendonitis in his knees. He couldn't even practice. And so he, he was an example of just never giving up. I don't think he felt he was an extraordinary person. So you don't always feel you're an extraordinary person. But he just was, I'm not going to give up. I'm going in this race and I'm not going to give up. And so as he's running, he begins to catch up on the pack. And he even said, when I caught to the pack, he said, well, maybe I can make third place. And he just keeps running and he just keeps running. And when it's all over, he was the winner. Never give up in being an extraordinary person, amen? The second one, you guys who like basketball and back in the day, because I knew, I saw this person, but I, I'm not a big basketball person. But anyway, his name is Spud, they, his nickname is Spud, Spud Webb. And they used to have slam dunk competitions, and I think they still do, I think I did see one. And so anyway, in 1986, he was competing with Dominic uh, Wilkins, and I do remember him. And Dominic, I don't know how tall he was, but he was pretty tall. But Spud was only 5'7". So in the basketball world, that's really little, right? Short. And so they're doing a slam dunk. I mean, you know, we're talking about jumping up and getting the thing in the thing. And so, <laughs> getting the thing in the thing. All right, y'all know what I mean. Sounds like two syllables, okay. And so they don't show Dominique, but they just show Spud on this videotape. And I mean, you know, like if, if this is low, but if this was the thing, Spud is way down here. So when he jumped, he got a jump. I mean, he's like, you need to take a running jump. But he was also kind of flamboyant. And so he was a cat, and he might twirl around and do something, but he got up to that basket. And so you got a couple of tries each time, and you had to get 50 points to win, and he got 50 points. I, don't, I think Dominique was 48, so of course he was close. But, but, but back in that day, in 1986, that was a big deal that the little short 5'7 man beat the tall guy doing this basketball thing, okay? Now, I do believe, just from what I understand of uh, Spud, he believed in himself. He believed that he could do that, and so he did it. You know, so I do think that once you take on something, believe in yourself, but greater still, believe that God can use you to do something different and to do something great. Amen. Now, this wasn't a videotape. Um, this is a, a, a story that I saw, and this guy's name is Anthony Omari, and this happened in, he's 20, 24, this happened in uh, 2012. 
And so what it was is that his mother had an orphanage in Kenya, and there were 35 orphans at, the, at Kenya, uh, at this orphanage. And so the night before, and he was like, like the janitor, the maintenance person, and he would usually stay overnight, you know, protecting the kids, watching over the kids. And so one night, these guys came, and they were trying to, I don't know if they're trying to kidnap the kids, or they thought it was some money there, take some property, but he was, they, they came. Well, he saw them, and he took a hammer, and he hit one of them in the head, and he got them away, okay? Well, they came back the next night, and it was three of them, and they had a machete. Well, all of them had machetes, and y'all know machete, the big knife Kirby thing, right? And so um, they, they also came looking for him because they knew he was there the night before. And so he fought these guys off because he felt he had to protect these kids. And when you see his picture back then, his face was sliced from here to here. They show stitches. Ex ordinary person doing an extraordinary thing. And the story goes that some man who was part of, uh, you know how they have these communities that raise money for stuff on the internet? I think it was, it's called Reddit or something. They, when he went into the hospital, they heard about it and they uh, had asked, this particular one guy asked, let's raise $2,000 to you know, help him and the orphanage, and primarily the orphanage, and they raised $80,000 like in a very short amount of time, maybe in 24 hours, something like that. You know? So people coming together because of this young man, and that orphanage is still in existence today. The last film I had, and at and, and some point I'm going to show this to y'all because I, I've been waiting. I, I've had this a long time and uh, um, thought this was the appropriate time, but I'm going to, I want y'all to see this. Some of you all have seen this. And so, of course, we know we went through some times when police officers were unfortunately killing uh, young black men and it just seemed every day something was happening, right? And so, this happened in Texas and uh, this young man, uh, his last name was Gene, G-E-A-N, and uh, he was shot, was killed by a police officer. The police officer went to jail. Uh, they had court, and in the court, and if you look at this, this guy's brother, the brother, young, his younger brother, his name is Brant Gene. It's on your handout if you want to look at it. It's worth looking at. And it's a story about grace and forgiveness. And he got up on the stand, and you know, Families can get up on the stand and say, you know, yeah, I think they need to die or they need to whatever. You know, you get to have your peace and say what you want to say. But this young man, he said, you know, basically, I love my brother. I didn't want you to kill my brother. He said, but, and I know this is not where my family is coming from. He said, but I'm a spiritual person and I'm a Christian and I forgive you. He said, and I want you to be charged but I don't want you to be killed like my brother was killed, but I forgive you. And he just sat up there and just poured out love to this man who killed his brother on the stand. And at the end of all that he had to say, the man's wife was there and he said, may I please come down and hug his wife? And they allowed him to do so, that lady melted right in his arms. I mean, she just booed all over the place. It's a powerful, powerful video. So if you get a chance to look at it, if you don't, I'm going to use it for something. And you'll get to see it. But I, we would have been crying, y'all, because I was crying every time I look at it, you know? But the point is, ordinary young man being used of God for something extraordinary because he touched the hearts of everyone in that court. You know he did because it's not normal for the judge to say, okay, yeah, you can come down and hug that lady. They're not going to say that. And so all the things that happened, God was working, working to work. And anybody who sees that video, and you know, some people really felt like, you know, you shouldn't have gone that way because, you know, this white police officer killed your black brother, and whatever you feel about that, whatever you feel about that. But the younger brother, he got a chance to say what he felt and what he felt God was telling him to say for such a time as that. Amen? So what, what did God see in all these different people, whether they were the famous 
uh, biblical people or they're the ones that we hardly know about or even the everyday people uh, that we talked about. And so one of the main things God, God looks at is he looks at the heart. He doesn't look at what you do on the outside. You know, this is one thing where we should be so grateful. See, God is not really looking at all of our shortcomings and our faults and the different things that we've done like that. He's looking at our heart, and he's looking at the plan that he planned for our lives to do greatness and to do great things. Amen? In Moses, he saw obedience and faithfulness, even though, you know, every time we see Moses in the beginning, he's scared. He's scared to talk. He's scared to go do this. He's scared to do... But still, he saw in Moses something in his heart that he would be faithful and that he would be obedient. Because in the end result, even though he was scared, he still did it, didn't he? He saw in David, we talked about this a little bit last time, David was called a man after his own heart. And so for all David's failures and all the things that he did, David still had a firm faith. Remember I talked about, you know, David was out on the side of the hill with the sheep all the time. So he was out there talking to God and communing with God and having a relationship with God. And his faith was building every day. And he was, things were going on where, you know, he killed a lion and he killed the bear and with his bare hands. And he knew God could help him. And God came to his rescue. So he wasn't scared of Goliath. He had killed a lion. He had killed a bear. Nobody else knew about all that, but David knew. And Peter, Peter was a leader among the disciples, and he showed, uh, I looked at this thing, it said, Peter was enthusiastic. I wrote, Peter was impulsive also. Because, you know, Peter, Peter, Peter was just like, you know, I'm going to cut your ear off, man. Get off here. Right? But Peter is also the one that denied Christ, right? And so he was bold, bold to profess his faith in Jesus Christ. Because the thing that even though he had to cut, he cut the ear off, he believed in who Jesus was. So he was bold in his faith. And even though he denied him, he denied him because he was scared for himself. And he was feeling guilty because he knew who he was. He knew it was Jesus. So he still had boldness of faith. And sometimes God has to work with us and tweak some things with us to get us to the place that he needs to be. Amen? I want to remember, I told you I like some of the things I always look up what Google has to say. Listen to what Google had to say about Peter. It said, why did God choose Peter? And this is what Google said. But Jesus chose Peter. The main reason could not be Peter's character of his strength, but rather the strength of his faith. Deep down, God knew, I'm sorry, deep down, he knew himself to be weak and imperfect. Hence, he was convinced that his total security and strength could only come from a power greater than his own. The Internet Dictionary said that. That's deep. But Peter did have strength, inner strength, that faith strength. Amen? And that's what we want to have is that kind of faith strength. We want to have, you know, we want to have that kind of faith, that kind of uh, allegiance to God. Amen? Then Paul, God used Paul. Now, we, now think about Paul. Now, so Paul, really all his training came from being a Pharisee. You know, he, he knew all the laws and all that. Paul just had taken it a little too over to the left because he was like, you know, if you don't do what the Bible says, then you deserve to be killed. And this is why a lot of Christians... They didn't want to deal with him because Paul was having Christians killed because you wasn't living according to what he felt that the word meant, right? But he knew the word. That was part of his training. And he was very stubborn and persistent. And so God used him really to transform Paul into being one of the, and I, we almost say usually, the greatest uh, preacher of the gospel, right? And whether he's the greatest preacher of the gospel, certainly he is the one that the word over and over says again about Paul. What did Paul say? What did Paul do? And, and so when Paul met Jesus on the road, right, he was changed, dramatically changed. He swung to the other side, didn't he? So what does it take? This is, we're going to look at about eight things about what it takes to be used for extraordinary things for God, and we'll be ending. So the first thing is, God uses the weak. 
Let's look at the scripture, 1 Corinthians, uh, again, first uh, chapter 1, 27 through 29. I'm going to be reading this out of the N, uh, NLT, the uh, New Life Translation. God chose things the world considers foolish in order to shame those who think they are wise. And he chose things that are powerless to shame those who are powerful. God chose things despised by the world, things counted as nothing at all, and used them to bring to nothing what the world considers important. As a result, no one can ever boast in the presence of God. If anybody's ever called you stupid, foolish, uh, you can't do that, any of those kind of things, then God wants to use you. That's all right. Don't let it bring you down. Don't let it make you think I'm nothing and I can't do anything. God can still use you. See, God wants to use us not because we're weak, in spite of our weakness. Because you are weak. Because people do call you all that kind of stuff. He wants to use you. You remember like that uh, Uncle Sam poster they used to have? And he'd point out, we want you, right? Well, that's God. He wants you. He wants to use you. He wants to use you in your weakness because it really shows his power. When you do something and you, you're giving God the glory, it shows his power, okay? And God uses our weakness really because in those weak times, we tend to then turn to God, right? So he uses our weakness to bring out our dependence on him. Hebrews 11, 20, uh, 32 and 30 through 34 says, I do not have time to tell about Gideon, Barak, Samson and Jephthah, about David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what was promised, who shut the mouths of lions, quenched the fury of the flames, and escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned to strength. Each of those are examples of whose weakness was turned to strength. If you feel weak in any area, God can turn that to a strength. Amen? Number two, God uses broken people. Mark 2, 17, Jesus said, healthy people don't need a doctor, sick people do. I have come to call not those who think they're righteous, but those who know they are sinners. You know, isn't it something how when Jesus came, he didn't go to the Pharisees and say, you know, guys, I'm Jesus. God sent me, I want to use you to do some great things. He didn't go to them because he already knew. See, they was all into themselves, right? They were into like, on the outside, we pray, we give our tithes, but on the real deal, they was nothing like what they portrayed on the outside, and he knew that. So he didn't want to use them. Instead, he used the disciples, everyday men, right? And some of the women that came along, everyday women. Remember we talked about Rahab, she wasn't a disciple, but she was a prostitute. But she kind of became a disciple because then after she met uh, the men of uh, Israel and she believed on God, she began to change her lifestyle. She began to talk about that there's a Jesus, right? That's what it's about, right? So he wants to use those that when you look at your lives and other people look at your lives, um, you feel like my dreams, they... They're not coming true. You know, my dreams are broken. Uh, or you're going through some kind of hard time or you're in deep grief or, or you just have just this great sense of failure. I'll never be anything. Or every time I touch something, it fails. Uh, you just hear all the time the enemy yelling at you and sometimes real people yelling at you saying, you know, you're just not good enough. You're not good enough. You'll never be good enough. You're not pretty enough. You're not smart enough. You're not rich enough which is our lies. But those of us who may hear those things and who are believing those things, guess what? This is when God does his best work and steps in. You are exactly the people that he wants to use. Amen? Because the fact is, is that he does use broken and flawed and weak people. And all of us are those things in some way. Amen? You know, Pastor Steve has a teaching he talks about, and he says, how dark is your darkness? Everybody got a little darkness in there. And so God can get in there and clean that up and use you. But guess what? He can still use you even while you're working on the cleaning up part. 
See, we always think, I got to be perfect, right? I got to, I got to have it all together. I can't be used by God not until I get this all together. But he doesn't feel like that. The word lets us know that, you know, remember the story about the potter and the clay? Well, you know, we're like the, uh, the clay pots that God chose to put his glory in. But think about this. If a clay pot were to fall on the floor, what's going to happen? is going to break. Well, that's what happens to us sometimes. We are just human beings, and we can be broken spiritually, physically, and emotionally. But God can pick you back up and put you together and use you for a great cause. You know, I remember Pastor Steve had this teaching, and he was talking about the pots, and he had all different kind of pots. And one, he was talking about one of the pots were, was, you know, like some of them are real pretty looking, and you might sit that pretty looking one outside the front door or whatever, and then there's one that don't look so hot, you know. Maybe you got messed up a couple of times, and so that was an old pot or something. But God can use that pot. The pot that don't look so hot to everybody. The pot that nobody wants to use. The pot that you can't pay somebody to take. God can use that pot to do extraordinary things. Amen? 2 Corinthians 4 and 7 in the Good News Translation says, we who have this spiritual treasure are like common clay pots in order to show that the supreme power belongs to God, not to us. So really, it should be freeing to all of us to know that we don't have to have it all together for Jesus to see us and to use us. Amen? And he can use you right now, today, in whatever state you're in. Amen? Let's look at the third one. God uses obedient people. Luke eleven twenty eight 28 says, But even more blessed are all who hear the word of God and put it into practice. John 14 and 15 says, If you love me, you'll what? You'll obey my commandments. So obedience is important to God because it lets us know he knows that we love him, right? He knows that we trust in him. And it shows our faith in him because we're obedient to what he's asking us to do. And the good part about it, and we're not doing it for this reason, but that when you're obedient to him, he's going to reward you in some way. He's going to bless your life. He's going to uh, open up doors for you and do things in your life that you never imagined could come into your life. Amen? So all he's asking for us is to obey him. And what that simply means is that you put yourself in places to hear the word, to trust in that word, to submit and surrender to that word, and to do that word. Amen? That's being obedient. Number four, God uses people who trust in him. Psalms 9 and 10 says, And those who know your name put their trust in you, for you, O Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. My favorite, one of my favorite scriptures, Proverbs uh, <clears throat> 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all thy heart and lean not into thy own understanding and all thy ways. Acknowledge him and he shall direct thy path. Luke 16 and 10. Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. So I think, you know, to me, what that says to me, if you got a little talent, the little talent that you have, God can increase that talent. If you can sing a little bit, now I'm talking about singing, I'm not talking about croaking, I'm talking about singing a little bit, well, he can build on that, right? If you, you should be able to know if you're a person of influence. You know, are you the person in your group, everybody always listening to what you say? If you have, are a person who has some influence and you are a person who gives your life to Christ and you want to live the way he would have you to live, he'll let that influence become greater influence in a mighty way in other people's lives. Amen? You follow what I'm saying? So something that you consider little now, and this is why we need to know ourselves. We need to understand some of the gifts and the talents and the abilities that God has given us. But as you use those things, or there's things that you just like to do. You just always like to draw. Or you just always like to cook. You just always like to bake. Then you do those things, keep perfecting those things, and you know, like you're the person, like I have a coworker, she loves to bake. 
And so whenever we have functions in our office for Christmas, she always bakes everybody something. And I know she does it for other people because that's her thing she does. And so that little bit of influence. And, and so, you know, just like how we do here at the church, when we were giving water away and whatever, you don't have to do this all the time, but sometimes you can just use, you made some cupcakes, you can put a little sticker on there and say, God loves you, and so do I. Or I love you, and so does God. Right? A little bit of influence can carry to greater influence. And so maybe you think, well, when I make it big, then I'll, I'll start doing some generous things. I, 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 when I make more money, then I'll start tithing. But God can take whatever you got. You know, and we do believe in tithing and uh, tithing the tenth, and that's what the word says. But if you, you know, pay your rent, you better pay your rent. Because if your faith is not there to believe that God can get you your rent paid, or you can have a roof over your house, pay your rent. But I still believe you ought to do something to show God, I trust you, that you said that you, I could prove you that you would make a way for me financially, because that's what the, when he's talking about money. So, you know, I remember some minister saying he wanted to give and they didn't have anything to give, and so he just put a pencil in the offering thing, just to say, I, I ain't got nothing, Lord, but I want to. And God began to bless him. Well, I'm saying if you got a dollar or 50 cents or whatever it is, whatever it is that you believe you can trust God for, then do that. It's not about what we think. You know, that's one of the things about, why well, I kind of like that we don't pass a little thing down. Like, because when I grew up, you know, you was always passing the little plate down, and you could see who put what in there. And, and unfortunately, there were some people, because I heard some people, they just put a dime in there. They just put a dime in there. <laughs> well, maybe that's all they had. <laughs> Because if, if a dad was all they had, they really surely didn't want to give it. So I think it's good sometimes to die. I think it's good to do all of that. But, you know, sometimes we, we spiritual people, we talk about folks. So we got to cast that out of us, Jesus, right? I, I remember taking my, my girlfriend to, uh, I, I grew up in a Baptist church here in the city, a well-known Baptist church. And, and uh I remember coming home from college, and uh, I considered that my mother's church. I never considered it my church, and she was all involved. And of course, growing up, you had to go to church. You know, they take you to church all the time. You know, and so anyway, they had like a tea or something, and and so one of my girlfriends, I took her with me, and I thought she looked nice. But as we were talking, and I know I heard it. I know my girlfriend was standing next to her, and they heard it. And so this Baptist church, this was a church that. There were affluent people at that church back then in the day. And so they had like, you know, mink stoles and things and stuff. And so I heard the lady say, look at that dress. Mm, mm, mm. She couldn't find nothing better than that. There's church people. I was really hurt for my friend. And I, I found out she did hear it. And uh, you know what? I, I, it makes me wonder sometimes uh, because my friend is, is no longer in the Baptist church, she's Catholic, and I'm not saying about that. I'm just saying, you don't know what things are said. That's why I said being people of influence, how that makes you respond, right? And at least people I'll be saying something ought to be us, right? If you think it, keep it to yourself and then go home and pray that she can get a dress if you think that's what she needs. Okay, I'm sorry. I went to a place. God uses people who trust him. <laughs> so trust God just to take that first step, whatever that first step is, y'all. If it's about tithing, it's about forgiving, if it's about doing kindness, whatever it is, you do that step and let God, he'll help you with the rest. <laughs> Number five, God uses people who are willing. Now this is important. Because, you know, the scripture says, we know in Luke 22 and 42, Christ said, not my will, but yours be done. And so we need to understand, see, God is not a thief. He's not going to make you do anything that you don't want to do. That's why you have to be willing to, you have to be willing to get saved. Nothing's going to drag you up here like um, you see in the cartoons and you sitting back there and you maybe you saying, I ought to go up there, I don't know. And then something come grab you and drag you down. 
And it's not, it don't happen like that. Because that's a walk you got to make. That's why sometimes people don't want to get up and walk. Because we got to walk it. Now he's walking with us, but you know, really, we feel the walk, right? And so he is not going to make you do anything that you don't want to do with your whole heart and for real. He's not going to do that. He's not going to force us to do anything. So the question is, are you willing? Are you willing to say yes when something comes along and you know that that's God asking you to do something? Are you willing to let go of old ways and thinking what you think to step out of your comfort zone, really, and to let that thing go and to move forward with God, okay? So, and we need to understand if God is asking you to do something, this is God, he's not trying to trick you. He doesn't want you to be made a fool of or any of those kinds of things. He is with you. Think about this. Moses had a staff. David had a slingshot. There was a boy that had a simple lunch that fed 5,000 people or more. The question isn't whether what we have is good enough for God. It's whether we will offer what we have for his service. Right? And that's about us also. He's not asking you to be, think you the best and the best, the good, the good is, and good is not a word, but the very best you can be. He'll use you, amen? Number six, God uses people who are available. And I think this is important. You can be willing, you can have talent, you can be, oh, Lord, praise you, pray, I just want to be used, I want to be used. But if you're not available, he can't do nothing, right? So, and I've discovered that God doesn't need our ability. He needs our availability. Because if you're available, he can mold you and shape you into what he needs you to be. So if you, you have to come to a place where you have some available time for God, to offer to God, you know, willingly, or you'll never be able to put into practical application being used of God if you're not available to be used of God, okay? So every time the pastor or some leader comes to you and they, they ask you to do something, you say, oh, wow, I'd love to do that, but I, oh, I'm just so busy. Well, then you're not going to do nothing. So there has to come a time, and you know what? We understand that people have jobs and families and, you know, school or work or whatever, because we got a lot of stuff going on too. But one thing that I know that if we really say that we are disciples of Christ, or we say we are Christians, we say we believe in God, then at some point we have to offer ourselves up to be available to be used by him. And there's lots of ways you can be used. You don't have to be used to stand up here. You can be used to clean up. You can be used to, like when we have evangelistic outreach things. You can be used like when we were doing our um, back to school drives. and uh, That was a great time because really you all came out for that, but fold some clothes, stuff some bags, the food pantry. There's things you can do that you don't have to be in front if you don't want to be an in front person, right? There's lots of things. And certainly, please be praying for the pastor and his wife, for our pastors and leadership. You could be doing that. That's the least we ought to be doing, right? Pray for your church members, you know, especially during this pandemic, but we you look on our prayer list. We have people that are sick. We have people who uh, need to be saved. You just have all kinds of things going on. Do that. You can come out Saturday for prayer. Or you don't even have to. You don't want to come out? Get on, the, get on your phone. Get on your computer. You don't even have to put the video on. You want to have curlers in your hair? That's okay. Just be used of God, right? So you have to be able to be willing to be available. Number seven, God uses people who are skilled. Now, remember I said that he does use people that I believe that don't have skill, but he's going to use some people that have some skill because that's the talent that he gave you. And so, to me, we don't want to be people who are mediocre for God. So that if you have some kind of skill, then always hone up on your skill. You know, if you're singing, do some kind of practicing or, you know, that kind of stuff. Sing around the house and maybe, and if you really want to sing, that means that you got to go maybe do some studying, right? In terms of getting hooked up with, um, you know, a musical company or something or things of that nature. Or the way we are today, you can find a multitude of things on the internet. And you can practice with that, right? 
Do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti, do. You can do all that, right? Or you want to play an instrument, then, you know, there's plenty around. There's people around, uh, places you can go to. And again, uh, the internet is really great for, you know, you can be practicing. You can buy, uh, what I want to say, you can buy things that, training stuff to help you to learn how to play an instrument or whatever it is. You want to cook? Plenty of folks cook that some of them might be willing to help you learn how to cook in the church or your grandma or mama or whatever it is. And of course, all these cooking shows. It's stuff that you can do because you don't, you never know. You never know. Martha Stewart liked to just organize and cook and know everything, right? Yeah. Billionaire. And so it's people that we think of, they didn't just grow up and became Martha Stewart. They went through stuff, and they were an ordinary person. And many of these people, you see, something was going on in their lives. I believe part of her story was she was married, she got divorced, she needed some money, and so she started doing some stuff. You get what I'm saying? So God will use people who are skilled. I, I remember that I was asking Eddie about this. When he came to the church, the Coopers came to the church, and we, during back then, the praise and worship team was Mario, Tom Doggett and myself and Wes, Brother Wesley, and um, we didn't have a drummer. And so Eddie wanted to be a part of that. And so Eddie came and Pastor Steve, you know, he got the drums and Pastor Steve was good about helping y'all. You know, he, it's for the church, but it's about also um, increasing your ability. Because what kind of drummer could Eddie be if we had no drums, at least here? You know, I mean, if that was a dream of his, maybe his parents would give him some drums, or you better go someplace and get some drums, or practice some drums, I don't know. But he got the drums, and you know, Eddie be getting down, don't he? See, when I came, Mario was always getting down, you know? Mario, and uh, you know. But Eddie was the baby. He might not let me say that, that's my guy, Eddie. And look what God has done in Eddie's life. Minister of the church, full of the word of God, What's the saying? This is a pop quiz. What's the saying that Eddie says when he gets up here and preaches? What's something he says? He says it all the time. Word of God is sovereign. Right? See? Y'all got it. That's right. Influence started way back then. But it also started even with his family. And they made a decision to come to Abundant Life. And, and that's what, to me, a church should be. And this is what I really appreciate about Abundant Life, is that Abundant Life will help to birth those things that are in you. I know it helped to birth in me teaching and singing. You know, maybe I did a little bit of these things out in the world, but not to the degree that I've done at Abundant Life. Because I had the opportunity to do those things. And Elder Steve would recognize and Marion. Uh, we used to do with the women's. One of the things we used to do back in the, back in the day with the women, we would have, uh, each time, a different woman would get a chance to speak on something in the Bible that, you know, whatever you want to talk about. And those are, those are and these are great opportunities because y'all love us. That's how it was. You know, the congregation loved you, so if you messed up, you thought you was messing up, it wasn't so bad. Now, what Pastor Steve might do is take you, you know, actors all over. Okay, well, I think you could have done that like this, and, and we want to stay on time, and, you know, y'all know Pastor Steve. But he, he, you know, unless it's something really outlandish, you did something crazy before the people, he's not going to embarrass you. That's how God is, amen? All right, God uses people who are skilled. And then the last one is God uses people who have a sense of purpose. And, you know, we're always talking about we need to know what our purpose is. And some people do, and some people don't. But it is important, I think, that we stay before God and try to figure out, Lord, what am I here for? What is it that you want me personally to do? Because you have to come to a place to understand. If you can understand your purpose, that's what propels you on your everyday journey. So your purpose, whether it's spiritual or otherwise, and by I mean like, you know, on our jobs and things of that nature, really your purpose will set the values that you believe. See, if you're just money hungry, I watched this program last night. I like to watch all these zoo shows and animal things and stuff. And so they had this show about this guy named Joe Exotic. I don't know if y'all heard of him. And Joe Exotic, uh, he ended up, he's in jail now, 
uh, he had these <laughs> he had these animals, exotic animals, you know, like tigers and bears and lions on oh my, you know, all that kind of stuff. And what he was doing when he first started out, well, maybe he was okay in the beginning. But when he first started out, he it was almost like his little zoo or his little thing, and people could come and they would look at the animals, but he made you pay, okay? And so what his claim to fame was, he would uh, let you touch a camel or touch a lion or whatever. Now usually they were little cubbies, but some of them were big, so that was scary. But anyway, but as time went on, things began to change, and the people talk about him in, the, in this video, on this show, is that he became more money hungry. And so he began to breed lions and tigers. He called them ligers. And so, and when you interbreed like that, these animals, you're not really making them healthy. They could be getting sick, and most of them were sick, okay? And because they're, they weren't, that's not, they weren't made for that. They weren't made to be, a, one was made to be a lion, and one was made to be a tiger, okay? And so anyway, so he, and if they didn't measure up, if he felt he couldn't use them, then he'd sell them, and they found bodies of the animals on the land, and he was just about, it was about money. And so um, what I'm saying is that your purpose, when you know your true purpose, or whatever you think your purpose is, it sets your footsteps, because that's what he felt his purpose was. He wanted to be rich and famous, and he didn't care how he got there. You follow what I'm saying? So we need to understand what our purpose is, and it will set your beliefs, it will set your values, it will set what you give meaning to your life. And Paul is a great example, because your purpose will really determine what you do is what you do, right? This is what I do, because I believe I'm supposed to do this. And Paul was like this. It's why you do what you do. And so in Acts 26, 14, I'm going to read some of this. Saul, Saul, why are you harassing me? It's hard for you to kick against a spear. Or we hear the prick. Then I said, who are you, Lord? The Lord replied, I am Jesus, whom, are you, whom you are harassing. Get up, stand on your feet. I have appeared to you for this purpose, to appoint you as my servant and witness of what you have seen, what I will show you. I will rescue you from your own people and from the Gentiles I am sending you to open their eyes. Then they can turn from darkness to light and from, pow and from the power of Satan to God and receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are made holy by faith in me. So it was clear that Paul knew his purpose. Paul understood that God put him on this earth to go, his mission was to go and let people know about who God was, who Christ was, and he knew he was also uh, ministering to the Gentiles, okay? And so no matter what he faced, that, remember when uh, he was supposed to, he wanted to go to Rome, and they were saying, no, don't go, they're going to kill you. And he was like, no, I got to go. Well, this is the reason he was like, I have to do the things I have to do, because he knew what his purpose was. And he felt any time he could go, whether it was to leaders or anybody, and speak the word of God and share who Jesus Christ, that's why with King Agrippa, he had to go through his whole thing, because he believed that was his purpose. Are you understanding what I'm saying? So once you know your purpose and you have that big picture like Paul, that will dictate how you really live your life. So it's never too late to discover your purpose. Moses was 80 when he liberated the Israelites from bondage. Sarah and Abraham were 90 and 100 when they became first-time parents in a covenant to create a great people. Noah was 500 years old when he started building the ark. So the results of their actions show that God, he figures, or he has to set out that the time is just right, it's just perfect, okay? No matter, age is not an obstacle or a hindrance to being used powerfully by God. And so as we close, what I want us to remember is that we're living in amazing times today. There are uh, more people alive on this planet than ever before. There's all kind of ways to reach people and the potential, especially for the church, uh, to reach people and to have an impact uh, on this world that has all kind of, you know, hardships and things going on with it, um, to give a life-changing message by the way that you live and by the things that you say. Because what I want us to understand is that even if you don't understand your purpose as far as like, I'm meant to be a singer, or I'm meant to be whatever, let me tell you your main purpose, your everyday purpose is to live a life uh, unto God 
to live a life loving him, studying the word, uh, being an example to this world that there is a God, he is real, I live according to what the word of God says. That's our purpose, to praise him, to honor him, to love him. That's your ultimate basic foundational purpose. And so at the very least, we need to do that. And you can only do that by coming to him and saying, Lord, I believe that you died for me and my sins and that you rose again so that I can have a relationship with God. That's our basic pur purpose, to reconcile other people to our God that we believe is a loving and kind and great almighty God. Amen? But there are some other purposes that he has for us. And we as ex ex extraordinary people, he's calling us, you know what, and to just to do that. If you don't do any more than just live a life honoring God, that's extraordinary in these times we live in. You know, there's so many things going on, and the world expects you to bow to their way. And when you don't bow to their way, you don't dress like they dress, you don't talk like they talk, you don't do like they do, you're extraordinary. You need to understand that. So the good news is that God's plan doesn't rely on our greatness, but it relies on his greatness. And there are going to be coming times when, you know, you don't have the credentials that the world says that you need to have to do something. You're going to face Goliath of some sort in your life. You're going to face a Red Sea where there seems there's no, there's no passage. You're going to face these things in our lives. But you can be as triumphant and, and show extraordinary abilities, just like all those people did in Bible times past and some that we know of today, when you lean, trust, and rely, when you're willing and available to do the things that God has called us to do. So I need you to decide. And I pray you decide today, are you willing to be available to be used by God for such a time as this? So that God and I, we believe, and this is one of my favorite sayings, because I like the Transformers, there's more to you than meets the eye. Amen? Amen. Praise God. Let's give God a hand, praise. We certainly, I don't know who's coming up, but we certainly want to, you know, exhort you. And as Paul used to say, I beseech you, if there is someone who does not know Christ, because this is, this is what makes you extraordinary in your ordinariness, to come to a place to ask God to come into your life. And we want to give you opportunity here at this church and to those that are listening to us. And if you do that, you'll see a difference in your life. And so let's just pray a prayer. Father God, we just thank you so much for loving us that you would send your only begotten son to die on the cross for us. I believe that I am a sinner. I need you to change my life. And as you come in and take my life, I know that I will be changed. And I ask you to use me to do extraordinary things, to no longer be that ordinary person, that I will rise above the brokenness in my life, the weaknesses that I have, and all my faults and flaws, because you see beyond that, and you sent Jesus Christ to die on the cross just for that. I believe these things, and I thank you for it, and I receive Jesus Christ into my life now. And if you've done that for the first time, if you have a church, let them know. If you don't, call our church. And you can look on the website. Our number is 513 742-1159 and talk to one of the ministers that answers the phone and um, you know they can get you some information we love you we want you to uh, be men and women and young people who are strong in the things of God amen and we want you to understand even the people that you see up here talking and the people that you listen to doing midweek devotionals which is ordinary people allowing God to use us in extraordinary ways amen Amen. Amen. Let's give a hand to the Lord one more time. Amen. God bless you so much, uh, Sister Carol. Just a great message for us to think about. God uses ordinary people to do extraordinary things. He's going to use you. He's going to use me to touch somebody's life. Amen.
God is so good. I just want to make a couple of announcements, and I'm going to ask Brother Michael just, just to come up here for a minute. Um, just to highlight a few things, on Wednesday night, uh, we have our spiritual growth and wellness class, and uh, we're, we're dealing with the issue of fear, you know, how to overcome fear. You know, so I do want to welcome you to join us. It's on Zoom. Uh, you, if you don't want to download the Zoom for any of our services, uh, you can call in. There's a number that you can call and, uh, and log in uh, into a service. I also want to remind you a couple of things. Is any of you still in need of a, a Thanksgiving basket? Please do see uh, Sister Felina. Uh, she will sign you up. Also, we forgot to announce this last week. Uh, we are taking our winter coats. We do have a collection box up there. So if you do have, you know, a new or gently used winter coat or any hat or scarves, uh, we do have that collection box in the foyer. Uh, you can do that. So, uh, Micro, just, just come and tell us what's going on with the man this Tuesday. I mean, God has blessed us with wonderful and great men. On Tuesday, for the men's meet, or for the men's discussion in the Zoom meeting, we will be discussing brotherhood, and it's it's not enough for us as men to know each other, but we need to be there to support each other as well. So, we're going to look into the Bible and see what the Bible tells us about brotherhood, and it's going to be the same way we do every every other discussion. We're going to put the topic out, and we're going to share the topic and see what everybody else thinks, and we're going to grow from each other. And I'm looking forward to seeing you guys in the Zoom meeting. Amen. I, I want to tell you, we have a great time as men. I mean, we have godly men in this church who love God, who love their family, who love their spouses. Yes, I'm talking about your husband. All right? So <laughs> I want all the men, please join us. We're having a fantastic time. I also want to mention, um, if, you are, if you would like to join the new members class, you know, anyone who's been attending for, for some time now and you'd like to uh, join this class, please do see me or see Elder Steve or Pastor Dale. Uh, we would like to set up a class and we just got uh, done with one class actually, is that right? So we have, uh, yeah, Brother Louie and uh, Sister Carla who went through the classes, and they are excellent classes. So please do uh, talk to one of us. Also, before we close, we do want to honor and recognize all veterans. Do you have any veterans in the house? Come on, please just stand. Amen. We do appreciate. Amen, Brother Mike. Amen. Amen. Wow. Amen. Yeah, Mike Rogers was wondering about that. Amen. Renell. Amen. Emmanuel. So, so this is what we're going to do. Sister Early. Amen. Yeah, yeah. We have our brother Cooper. He comes from a family of military. Is that right? Sister Angie. So we do have a clip uh, that we wanted to play. Uh, do we have that clip? So we're going to play that clip. <laughs> Some of the folks, it's hard to recognize them. <laughs> Amen. Thank God. And, and in case we missed any of you, please, I'm sorry about that, but we do appreciate all of you. May God bless you so much. So we wish you to have a blessed week, and may God watch over you. Let's continue to shine for Jesus, for He is faithful. He wants to use you this week, make a difference, and be a blessing to somebody. God bless you.